Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Steve. Thank Anas. you, Dave. Good morning. I'm, how are you, buddy? Very well. Thank you. Uh, uh, you know, I'm interested in that tweet. I, I don't recall. Do you share screens during our interviews or do well, I? Well, today I have some slides I might share uh, oh, once okay. we get to them. Uh, okay. And if well, we why don't you then... do... Why don't you do that now then, just in case. So you, you hit the green box, share screen. Okay, uh, well, uh, let, let me start with the following. As you know, uh, today we have two events uh, that are important. Uh, we have the uh, EIA inventory report that comes out at 10.30 today, uh, Eastern time. And then since it's the end of the month, we have the 914 report, which we know about the production uh, and what happened in July. Uh, so these are important. And why July is important? Because uh, that's where the rebound in U.S. production happened after the collapse in oil prices. Uh, Have you ever seen a quieter period in the price of WTI and us? I mean, uh, you know, while the market risk on was blowing to the upside, it was just quietly range trading in a very tight range. It still is. Um, it used to be affected more by risk off and risk on. And to me, it seems like crude is uh, trading to the beat of its own drum. Yeah, Am we, I reading we had, it correctly? We, we had instances like this in the past. Uh, it just happened that uh, it, this happened during major wars. So it wasn't that clear the same way we do it today. Uh, but uh, uh, my view on this, and I think probably listeners need to pay attention to this point because it's not common and it's not a conventional wisdom, that everything in, in the oil market moves in stages. There is nothing linear in the oil market. Okay. And therefore, within every stage, we have to operate within certain range until we move to the next stage, which means that when we talk about the elasticities, we talk about the elasticity of demand and elasticity of supply, the price elasticity of demand and the price elasticity of supply, the conventional wisdom is that this relationship is linear. While it, it works for me when I look at it in stages rather than linear, and it explains a lot of things in the market. But to go back uh, to, for this month, we had several major events uh, this month. And one of the major events that we had is the 60th birthday of OPEC. Happy birthday, OPEC. And oh, yeah, and you told me about absolutely. what you found. Yes, so we got uh, a new documents and the new documents basically revealed some information that no one knew about before and never been mentioned in any of the uh, history books about the oil market and uh, OPEC. Uh, I'm going to share a screen here. Okay, now uh, I have to stop. So all right. wait for me. Uh, I'm going to stop share. I was showing your website and now you could do it. Hit the green box. Uh, and I hope, okay, got it. Uh, I'm getting a comment uh, from one of our attendees. Uh, oil market manipulated, just like all markets, my friend. What well, do you say? Well, uh, uh, all right. The oil market definitely is not competitive. Okay. At least, forget about OPEC and everything else there. The amount of regulations of the energy industry itself makes it uncompetitive. So okay. call it manipulated or any other terms. It is not competitive. Now, some regional areas, some, re or some regions, or some markets might end up competitive in some regions or in some periods. But in general, the oil industry is not competitive. It's managed. Um, managed or, in a sense, there are enough regulations to, uh, uh, to make it uncompetitive. Okay, so let's, let's get to... Uh, uh, OPEC. Yeah. Okay. May, May 2nd, 1960. Everyone knows, and that's what's in history book, that OPEC was established by five countries meeting in Baghdad between the 10th and the 14th of September, 1960. But the fact is, 
OPEC establishment announcement was made in Tyler, Texas on May 2nd, 1960. So the oh. announcement was made in Texas before even Baghdad or Cairo or any other uh, Arab cities where the negotiations were taking place. What's the significance of that? Well, the significance of this, in my view, after reading those documents and looking back at what I learned over the years, is that it seems that OPEC founders assumed, or uh, let me rephrase that. Um, uh, Pires Alfonso, Juan Pires Alfonso, who is the uh, development minister in Venezuela at that time. I, I think he is uh, seriously one of the great oil men in history, uh, and he is a, a philosopher at the same time. He studied the management of the Railroad Commission of Texas and how it managed production in Texas. So he okay. came up with the idea of, okay, we have pro-rationing of production in Texas. Can we take that global? That's the basic idea. And to take it global, that means they have to talk to the oil producing countries. The problem is oil producing countries at that time had no control over their resources because what we call the seven sisters controlled the oil resources of various countries. And the seven sisters reach a point in the late 50s where they were competing with each other. So there is no interest in cutting production and doing pro-rationing. Okay. So the idea was, if we take this global, then it might work, but governments have to do it. And in Texas, the government was doing it. So later on, he heard about Abdullah Turaqi, who became an oil minister in Saudi Arabia later on, who is pictured in the screen here when he announced OPEC. So this is the picture that we got. That's the moment he announced OPEC in Tyler, Texas. And the idea was, we are going to establish OPEC and they assumed that the Texas Railroad Commission will continue pro-rationing in Texas. And the commission in Texas and in, in Oklahoma and other places will continue doing their role. So one of the problems that OPEC encountered over the years, and to go back to the price volatility that you mentioned earlier, one of the problems why price volatility increased during OPEC time was that the Texas Railroad Commission stopped doing its work. So it okay. was a basic, it seemed like it was a basic assumption from OPEC founders that the United States will continue the pro-rationing and they do it on the international level, and therefore it should work. Okay, can you explain the pro-rationing to our viewers? The pro-rationing basically is managing production to meet demand. So always Balance. try to reduce production to meet demand. Do not overproduce. Okay. That's what or under, is. or under to or, drive or up and, prices. Or, or under, correct, correct. Okay. Uh, most of the time, the, their ideas was that producers and companies will always overproduce and therefore we needed the government to do it. Okay, okay? got so it. So that's number one. Number two, uh, this is uh, the picture of Juan Pablo Perez Alfonso. Uh, and this is the program of TIPRO that the Texas uh, uh, oil producers are royalty owners, uh, with one of the oldest uh, organizations uh, in the United States uh, in the oil business. And uh, this is the program, and the arrows basically point to the time of speaking, and all of them basically were prime times. So they were really given prime times at the conference to, talk of, to take that pro-rationing uh, global, and Texas producers were really excited about it. Who's the gentleman in the lower left-hand corner? This is a man who got the award for Tipro at that time. I think this man passed away a long time ago. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, he's an oil man. Okay. Uh, but the idea here is forward 60 years. What is OPEC problem today? Shale. Why shale is a problem? Because it overproduced. Why it overproduced? Because the Texas Railroad Commission is not pro-rationing production. Okay. So, so uh, sense, we are yeah. going in full cycle over 60 years to yeah, see the something. impact and the difference. That's really interesting. 
so th that's the first. Thanks for uh, the history lesson. You're welcome. And I, and, I, and I bet most people would not know now that uh, OPEC was started in the U.S. and Texas. Uh, I would say 99% of the people, including me, before today thought that it would have had its roots in the Middle East and Absolutely. not here in the U.S. Absolutely. Very interesting. And, uh, and uh, basically, it comes from Texas in two ways. First, the idea came from the Railroad uh, Commission of Texas. Yeah. And the second one is the announcement was made in Texas. Okay. What was missing from the history, too, is that after announcing it in Texas, they had a big party and they announced it in Caracas, in Venezuela. That was not mentioned in the history books of the oil industry either. Did uh, Venezuela have, uh, did they know what kind of reserves they were sitting on at that time? Were they a not, major player not, at that time too? Th they were a major player for a long time. They did not know, of course, they have this much that the, the amount announced today, which is about 300 billion. But uh, I have kind of a different explanation of why the Venezuelans basically been interested in the Middle Eastern countries and forming OPEC and how, uh, why the Shah of Iran and Iraq, all of a sudden they are interested in cutting production and cooperating with OPEC. I think OPEC was established, uh, uh, th there was a common goal among all of them, but each one of them have a competing interest. So the seeds of divergence and competition was already in OPEC anyway from day one. Okay. And the reason why, because uh, um, Juan Perez Alfonso, who, whom I have a great respect for, um, when he came up with his ideas, his government did not like his ideas. The politicians were very corrupt at that time. And that that's time. why he got, he got, well, all the time, right? Baba. <laughs> I, yeah, I was, I, you know, it would have been nice if we politicians had gotten over corruption back in the 50s and 60s. We wouldn't be where we are today. But Absolutely. yeah, go, go ahead. Absolutely. Buddy. He was go an ahead. honest man and, and the politicians around him were very corrupt and they did not buy his ideas. Of course, there were several coups and he lost his position. He came into the United States when after the coup and then he came back when a new government came in, etc. It's a long story uh, in, in Venezuelan politics. But the idea was when he presented his government with the idea of OPEC, they did not like it. They ignored him until they realized that oil is cheaper in the Middle East and companies were shifting their investment to the Middle East and right. the Middle East started taking market share from Venezuela. Right. Okay. So they literally used him. They called on him and said, oh, remember your ideas, the one you told us about and this stuff? Go ahead and, and work on it. He believed them. He believed that they are working for the well-being of all the undeveloped oil producers and it's for the well-being of humanity. And that's his thinking was. But yeah. those guys really were thinking about money. Right. So the moment he was successful in achieving his objectives, basically, uh, they, 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 they put him on the side and they, they ignored him. Was uh, the uh, Bush family involved in this? Texas, Bush, oil? Th that was before them. That okay. was before, b before them. Because okay. we are talking about the 50s, uh, 40s okay. and 50s. But right. the idea here is the interest in Venezuela was try to convince the Middle Eastern countries to Im impose taxes, go for 50-50 profit, etc., so the Middle Eastern oil will not be as competitive. So their okay. idea was really kind of to nail the Middle Eastern producers, not to help them. But Alfonso Perez wanted to help, but he was used, in my view, by them uh, uh, to, to achieve this goal. Okay. Very interesting history. Uh, what, what do you want to move to now? You have more of this? Uh, well, not in this, basically different, uh, different topics. Uh, I'm, okay. I'm going to uh, switch to something else since we are on uh, limited time here. So okay. I'm going to... Um, okay. One of the missing topics from the discourse in energy today is this. Everyone is talking about peak 
uh, demand for oil. Not yeah. everyone, but you know, some, some companies and some people are talking about big demand for oil. Of course, I can prove everyone wrong. That's not the case. And I know the mistakes in their forecasts. But I'm not going to focus on that. I'm going to focus on this, that they are forgetting about the reaction of the oil producing countries, how they are reacting to this. Because when you are telling the oil producers, oh, by the way, uh, oil demand, uh, global oil demand is going to peak in 2022 or 2025 or 2030. How do you think the investors are going to react? How do you think the oil producers are going to react? They are, if they believe you, they are going to shy away from it. And by the time uh, you think we are going to have big oil, we are not going to have enough oil because there is no investment. So by telling people we are going for, for peak oil demand and people think oil prices will decline, we might have the biggest spike in history. So how That's those really oil producers are going to react? I put yeah. this behavior in four uh, animal behaviors, as you see in the slide here. Okay. So either you behave as a lion, as a rabbit, as a tiger, or as a fox. As a lion, basically, is you ignore all this rhetoric, and you do what you do best, just drill and produce. Okay. Or Who's doing rabbit. that? Who's doing that currently? Who are the well, lions? Hist historically, historically, this happens several times, but now we are seeing less and less of it. Okay. And, and we will realize this once we get to the to the last one. Okay. The second one is rabbit. Rabbit is believe them, produce as much as you can, literally that will lower prices, and then just run away, run away from oil, do something else. Okay. So some countries with, especially with lower reserves, that's what they are doing. Probably the Russians are even doing that. Interesting. The tiger is, okay, you are going to compete with me and you think that oil, uh, you don't want my oil and oil is going to peak. Here is what I'm going to do. I'm going to crash the market. I'm going to make oil the cheapest liquid there is and show me what you can do. Saudi and Russia. That's what we've seen. Earlier, so the idea yes. here is I'm okay. going to attack and cheap oil is going to stall all those developments that you are thinking about. Right. But they cannot do this often because... They have a population to support. They have economic development programs to support, etc. So they can do it from time to time, but they cannot do it all the time. Okay. So they resorted to the fox behavior. Outfox them all. How you outfox them all? They say, okay, you are going to use electric vehicles. You are not going to use my oil. You are going to use renewable energy to produce electricity to supply that vehicle instead of gasoline and, and, and diesel. Go for it. I'm going to make sure that the body of the car is made from oil. I'm going to make sure that every part of that car is made from oil. You want to go for uh, wind turbines? I'm going to make sure that every part or most of the parts in that wind turbine is made from oil. You want to go for solar? I'm going to make sure that everything you need to build that solar is made from oil. Oil to materials is the new approach. That's the new stuff that's coming up right now. Okay, and investors, are there any currently? Yes. Uh, any yes, that you mentioned that uh, oil is a big component of? Yes. Yeah. Well, right now, if you look at what Saudi Arabia is doing on a large scale, basically, that's part of their plan. That's part of the 2030 vision. That's part of what after 2030 vision. So the, the problem for me is if Saudi Arabia and other producers go for oil to material, of course, that includes petrochemicals and plastic and everything else. Right. If you go for oil, oil to materials. And then the European governments and other liberal governments around the world do not deliver on their renewable energy and EVs. And the electric and people are not going to buy as many EVs as EV supporters think then we are going to end up with a massive oil shortage. How long would that take to develop in your mind? Are um, we already, is it already happening? It's, it's already happening. And I think uh, I'm probably we are talking about 10 to 15 years for this okay. to hit really hard. Uh, but the idea here is uh, this is not in the discussion. No one is talking about how investors 
and how oil producing countries are going to react to this rhetoric of peak demand. And we need to bring the, whether what I mentioned was extreme or not, it has to be part of the discussion. What because a great perspective. It impacts us oil. It impacts, it impacts us all. It impacts politics and it impacts economics. Can I ask you something, Anas? Uh, you know, sure. I did a summit over the weekend and uh, interviewed someone who's, you know, wheelhouse is oil. Uh, who was bearish, who was flipped to bullish. And they started talking about what was happening in certain African countries. Um, I think Mambia, if I recall correctly. Are you seeing anything in Africa that also is part of this jigsaw puzzle? In terms of increasing production, bringing more resources, yeah. or, or yeah, or, like or... development, development. Okay. They're in the state. They're, despite everything you've said, I believe Africa, uh, they are finding reserves and beginning to develop and produce. Well, we don't have countries. even to go that far, just to look at Guyana and Suriname. They are very okay. close to us. Okay. And, and look at the major development they experienced in the last few years, and now they are bringing massive amount of oil. But this is so not this the could issue. really be a windfall for Africa because they're taking the opposite tact of uh, in di of the t of the lion and the rabbit um, and the tiger. Yes, they, but they they may be a fox, Africa. Well, it's not only a fox. Basically, we have another another issue here. If we want to go farther on the oil demand issue that per capita oil consumption in those countries is just like the United States 200 years ago. Okay. So the, the story of Africa is not the supply side. The story of Africa is the demand side. Okay. And about over a year ago, I was in a major conference in, in, uh, in uh, Abu Dhabi, and one of the African ministers basically was extremely angry at some European uh, ministers. And he said, now you are talking about climate change after you guys used oil for 150 years and after you enjoyed very high per capita income and enjoyed your life and all this stuff. Now you want to move to it and force me. I just started. Force me basically to stay where I am. It's not going yeah. to happen. Yeah. So yeah. the bottom line is any person in Africa or any of those poorer countries in Latin America or Asia wants exactly what you and I have today. They don't want a lower living standard than w the way we live today. They look at us up and they say, I want to be like that guy and I want that car and I want that house and I want this in my house. Everyone yeah. wants th this. So the idea is all of a sudden they are going to say, oh, for the sake of climate change, I'm going to stay in my hut. Hot. Yeah, uh, hot. And, and, and I'm, I'm not going to send my children to school. Yeah, not, not happening. Absolutely. Let me ask you this, and I'll to wrap it with. You know, oil's been under a little pressure here over the last few days. Do you have um, a price level on WTI that you think would be a floor for any, um, any decline in oil from, you know, that we had from the low 40s, uh, say 35 or 32? Um, uh, where you don't think the mar uh, oil will give back that much. In, in one word, what's your floor for oil prices in your uh, scenario? Just a clarification before I say it. I mean, th that oil could be penetrated for several hours or a couple of days, whatever okay. the floor is. So we are not talking about like a firm floor. That's it. You cannot penetrate it. Yeah, but okay. Cannot... It's a mattress instead of a floor. Uh, co correct. It gives. Correct. Okay. Correct. correct. All right. 38. 38. Okay. Appreciate it. And you really do believe uh, that we could end up with a super spike, um, what, in the next five to 10 years? Because, because I mean, the, the spike is going to happen earlier than that because of various issues. I mean, let's remember, I know we are out of time, but remember that we are having a serious problem with shale today. Yeah. Uh, shale is supposed to produce by next year, by the end of next year, we're supposed to reach 14 million based on the forecast. We might end up with less than 11. So we are already because they're all going BK and capping wells. No, basically because of lower investment okay. versus high decline rates. Okay. 
Anas, I, I tell you what, you're always an eye opener. Uh, great presentation. I really appreciate you taking time and edifying our community. And like I said yesterday, when I reached out for you, I was trying to book you for another date. I didn't know that we had one today. But uh, I'll get a hold of you on Twitter. What's the best way for people that have an interest in this to follow you and, you know, stay informed with your narrative in the oil market? Is it just I, Twitter? Uh, I use Twitter as my school. Uh, okay. I, what I mean by school is I teach others and I learned at the same time. Uh, so my handle is uh, uh, at Anas Alhaji, A-N-A-S-A-L-H-A-J-J-I. So it's my first name, my last name, uh, okay. which is the same. Uh, what my website is the same, uh, Anas uh, Alhaji. Uh, and uh, probably the, those two are the best way to contact me. Okay, much respect to you, Anas. Thank you. I really appreciate you being here today. Everyone, that's a wrap. Uh, the crowd liked it. And... Uh, uh, I'll get a hold of you on uh, Twitter, and we'll we'll book something in December. Okay, buddy. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right. So that's a wrap, okay. everyone. Remember, don't count your barrels, count your blessings, and have a great rest of the day trading. We'll see everyone tomorrow. Adios.